Um, hi everyone, so we learned in the videos last week a little bit about the research design for the carbon dioxide flux practical and we looked at how we sampled CO2 and we looked at the equipment that we used. So today we're going to have a look at that equipment in a little bit more detail and look at exactly how it works and what kind of data it allows you to collect. So in terms of measuring and monitoring CO2 fluxes, we use this piece of equipment here, which is our ERGA or our infrared gas analyzer. And we use that in combination with this piece of equipment here, which is our gas assimilation chamber. So we saw how when we carried out the data collection that you're gonna use for the practical, we had a series of gas collars. And our gas assimilation chamber sits on top of those gas collars. And you can see here there's a, a lip which is actually quite sharp and once the chamber's on top of the collar it creates an airtight seal. You can also use the chamber just on its own on top of any surface and push it down to make sure there's an airtight seal. You may be able to see inside the bottom of the gas assimilation chamber there are a number of small holes. So once our chamber is in place samples from inside the chamber are sucked into these holes and then they travel up this wire here into the ERGA. So from our chamber there's a wire that connects to this which removes any moisture from the air sample so that's just so it doesn't damage the equipment into this tube here and you may be able to see on top it says gas in. So our air sample from the chamber is entering the main body of the ERGA. So how do we detect how much carbon dioxide is within the air sample? Well, we know that carbon dioxide really strongly absorbs radiation in the infrared wavelength band. So there's a tube inside our infrared gas analyzer which contains the samples of air from our chamber. At one end of the tube is a light bulb and that light bulb is emitting photons in the infrared range. So that's about 4.26 microns. At the other end of the tube is a sensor which is detecting how much of that radiation is reaching the other end of that tube. The less radiation reaches the other end of the tube, we know the more radiation is being absorbed by the gas, so the higher the CO2 concentration in the sample there must be. Once that air sample has been measured, it then leaves the ERGA through this tube here which says gas out down to the pipe and it's recycled back into the gas assimilation chamber. So over a course of two minutes when we leave our chamber on the surface that we're measuring, gas is continuously cycled between the chamber and the ERGA and we take readings for CO2 concentration every about 4.7 seconds. So we have 27 measurements over the course of our two minute period. What we then do is have a look at those 27 measurements to see how the carbon dioxide changes over time. So really we're looking at whether the concentration of carbon dioxide increases, which would suggest our system was acting as a source of CO2. So remember that means it's giving off more CO2 through respiration than it's taking in through photosynthesis, or whether the concentration of CO2 decreases if it decreases over the measurement period, that would suggest that our system is acting as a CO2 sink. So then it's taking in more carbon through photosynthesis than it's emitting through respiration. So now we know a bit about how both of the instruments work, we're going to use them to take some measurements. So we're going to do some practice recordings of CO2 fluxes just from the surfaces around us today. So we have our gas assimilation chamber which has got a nice tight airtight seal. So here we're going to be measuring, monitoring the carbon fluxes from grass and the underlying soil. So it's a November day, it's probably about 10 degrees. It's not particularly sunny and we've got soil here and we've got vegetation here. So before we start the reading, just have a think. Do you think the concentration of CO2 in the chamber is going to increase or decrease over the course of the measurement period? Okay, so we're ready to take our first measurement. You may be able to see on the screen of the Jurgen, it's asking for the plot number. 
and it wants a two digit number so we're going to type in zero one shows here as one and then press yes the next thing it tells us is that the chamber is flushing and we should hold it into the air this is so any air inside the chamber that has accumulated from the previous reading is then evacuated so the co2 concentration within the chamber remains ambient this is so any air with particularly high or low CO2 concentrations doesn't disturb the flux of CO2 from our current measurement. And you may be able to see here inside the chamber we have a small fan which acts to evacuate that old air. So back to our ergo, we can see it's telling us to place the chamber on the soil and then press yes to start. So I'm popping the chamber down on the soil now, again making sure it's got a good seal and then pressing yes on our erga. Okay, so it's telling us that it's equilibrizing, so we just let it do its thing. And then we can have a look at the screen to see how the concentration of CO2 changes. So this top value here, where it says C, this is our concentration data. And this is telling us the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air samples. And the units we're using here are parts per million. This next value here on the screen where it says T, that's telling us about the approximate temperature. And the bottom value here where it says 0.33, tells us how long we've been going for from the start in seconds and this leaps up every time we take a co2 measurement so about every four or five seconds the bottom value here tells us about the change in carbon dioxide values so if it's a negative number that means our co2 concentration is going down if it's a positive number we're getting an increase in co2 concentration Finally, this figure in the middle at the bottom tells us about the concentration of photosynthetically active radiation that's reaching our chamber. So it's a light sensor and you may have noticed before the light sensor inside the chamber. So we've been going for about 81 seconds now and if you notice at the start the concentration of carbon dioxide was about 420 parts per million or slightly higher. It looks like then, since the start of the reading, the concentration of carbon dioxide has been steadily going down. So we're on around 400 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the chamber at the moment. So remember then overall that tells us if the concentration is going down, it must be being used up by the underlying surface. So effectively then, carbon sequestration via photosynthesis is of a greater magnitude than carbon release via respiration. We've been going for just over two minutes. We can see at the bottom there, it's telling us the reading has ended. So at this stage, we press yes. Do we want to record our measurements? We do. It's then telling us to remove the chamber from the soil and press the yes key. Now we're on to the main screen, so if we wanted to do a new reading, we could change the plot value and record some more data. So now we've seen how the erga and chamber work to take readings, and we've seen what the data looks like when we monitor CO2 flux from a grassland under light conditions. So we saw in the recorded videos how in order to quantify both the fluxes from photosynthesis and the flux from respiration separately, we need to take recordings in both dark and light conditions. So we're going to have a look at that now. So we'll change the plot value from 1 to 2 for our new plot. And we're flushing the chamber in the air because the air sample previously in there was depleted in CO2 because we know that the system was acting as a carbon sink and removing carbon dioxide from the air sample. So our fan's whirring round and I can actually feel it evacuating the air. So it's telling us to place on soil. So I'm placing the chamber on the soil 
and then covering it with some blackout material that's going to prevent any sunlight from reaching the vegetation on the, on the ground. That's all ready, we're ready to start. So I'm pressing yes to telling the erga to begin its reading. So again, we're looking at the concentration of carbon in the top corner there. So consider how you think that might change. Now we're eliminating photosynthesis and only measuring the flux from respiration. So we started off on just over 420 and you should be able to see here the concentration of carbon dioxide is slowly increasing within the chamber. So remember, every time we see our time value, time in seconds, every time that increases, that's when we will record the concentration of CO2 in parts per million. So when you look at the data on the Excel spreadsheet, every time interval, so approximately four or five seconds, you'll see the time in seconds and the associated concentration of carbon dioxide in parts per million. Again, we can see that the carbon dioxide concentration there is still increasing. So that's telling us then that in this case, our system is acting as a carbon source. So we're not monitoring or measuring any flux from photosynthesis. We're only measuring fluxes from respiration. We know that they must be positive because any microorganisms or decomposers are releasing carbon dioxide through respiration. So that's why we see this value increase. You should also be able to see on the Yerga that bottom middle value where we were monitoring PAR, so the intensity of sunlight, that during the dark values that number is zero and that's telling us that there's no light being detected by the PAR sensor, no light inside the chamber and so the underlying vegetation will not be able to photosynthesize. So we'll fast forward now to see what the concentration is like at the end of the reading. So you can see here the concentration has reached 445 parts per million of carbon dioxide, which was greater than the concentration that we had at the start. So when we look at our data, we're not just going to use the start and end values. We're going to use all 27 readings recorded over that two minute measurement interval to calculate the overall flux of carbon. And you'll be seeing how we do that when we start the practical.